Hello everyone and thank you for attending today's webinar, Talking to the Board, How to Improve Your Board's Cybersecurity Literacy. My name is Melanie Jewell and I'm very pleased to welcome you all today. I am the EMEA Marketing Manager for Tripwire and I will be hosting today's webcast. Before we begin, we wanted to cover a few housekeeping items. If you have any questions during the webcast, you can click on the Q&A widget at the bottom and submit your questions. We will try to answer those during the webcast, but if there are fuller answers needed or if we run out of time, we will follow up with everybody afterwards. You can expand your slide area by clicking on the maximize icon on the top right of the slide area or by dragging the bottom right corner of the slide. If you have any technical difficulty, please click on the help widget. It has a question mark icon and covers common technical issues. As on -demand, an on-demand version of the webcast will be available approximately one day after the webcast and can be accessed using the same audience link that was sent to you earlier today. And now I'd like to introduce our presenters. We are joined today by Amar Singh, founder of Give Zero One Day and Cyber Management Alliance and Interim CISO, Ray Stanton, Executive Vice President, BT, and Gary Cheatham, CISO of NFU Mutual. And last but not least, I'm very pleased to be joined by Paul Eden, who is Director of Customer Services here at Tripwire. Paul is going to moderate today's session, and I'm now going to hand over to him to introduce himself and get the webinar started. Over to you, Paul. Thanks, Melanie. Good morning, everyone, and welcome. Uh, as mentioned by Melanie, my name is Paul Eden. I'm the International Service Director for Tripwire. Um, I've been involved in the security of data in all its forms for about 35 years. 22 of those were spent uh, working for um, a government <coughs> intelligence agency and the remaining 13 various commercial IT security companies, the last eight of which have been Tripwire. Um, as you said, today's webinar will take the form of a panel discussion, uh, and it's around how we improve our board's cybersecurity literacy. The panel consists of three well-respected personalities, each recognized for their contribution and thought leadership within the IT security sector. However, each is from a different business vertical, and I'm really hoping uh, that we'll note some significant differences between the way in which they work with their boards. I'll introduce each in turn, and then I would like them just to give us a, a brief background from, uh, for each of them. So, Amar, if you wouldn't mind going first. Okay. Um, greetings to everyone. My name is Amar Singh. Um, very easily recognizable with the blue turban. Um, I'm an interim CISO, so I actually uh, get to move between various kind of different companies. So that's the the experience I bring. I'm the founder of Give One Day. It's a uh, not-for-profit movement um, helping charities. I've been in cybersecurity IT for the last 17 years. And uh, I'm here to share my views in terms of how, you know, we can tackle the issue of presenting what is a very, very complicated domain with multiple subdomains up to those uh, folks who may not have an understanding of exactly what it is. Thanks, Amar. Um, Ray, if you'd like to go next. Thank you, Paul. And good morning and good afternoon to anyone listening on recording. So I'm Ray Stanton. Uh, I've been doing information security and security for 30 plus years. I currently work at BT and I run one of our services businesses. I also am still, because of my background, a advisor on risk and security to our board. And on my background, I was CISO at British Aerospace and Airbus for around 10 years and at Unisys as well. So today, again, I'm looking forward to having the open debate and discussion as well as giving some tips and hints on how to engage the board. Thank you. Thanks, Ray. Uh, last but not least, Gary. Yeah, good morning, good evening, good afternoon to everybody. Uh, my name is Gary Cheatham. I am the Chief Information Security Officer for a company called NFU Mutual. We are a UK-based uh, rural insurer. Um, and uh, I'm responsible for all the information assets that uh, our organization has throughout the life cycle and up and down the supply chain. My background has been in financial services and retail. 
um, and um, I'm seen as uh, the prime information provider to our board around anything to do with security of those assets. Um, I don't report through Group IT, I report up through the Finance Director, which actually means that I'm our CIO's best friend and his worst enemy. Um, but more recently on cyber risk, cyber security, we've been working very closely together. Thanks, Gary. Uh, okay, well, let's kick off with the uh, and get straight into the first question. And I'd like to start this one with Ray. Um, so, Ray, when, when you actually meet with your board, what details are they looking for from you and, and why? So it's a great question, and the key thing here is about relevance and the relevance of the information to the board and to our business. And the key thing here is, is around two areas. Really, it's about exposure to the organization. Now, exposure can come through operational impact or brand impact, but it really is about making sure the details that we come to them with are around the relevance and exposure to our business lines. And they really want to see it fact-based as well. Because if you come in and it's all here, say, you know, we've heard something, this is what we, you know, we're looking at, it really doesn't help them. What they want to do is see you come to them with some fact-based information as much as you can, you know, maybe in the middle of an incident, but maybe when it's outside of an incident, but come with what you've got, but also come with pragmatic information and solutions. Don't come as a drama queen and expect the world that come with very simple solutions that they want you to present to them to help get their input on. And in the end, it's a business decision. But really, what you've got to do is make sure you come with clarity. So the details are those that are relevant to them and the business. You know, whether it is a impact to the business lines, you know, and you can make it a financial impact, or to, like I say, brand association. But really understanding that relevance. So that's some of the key things that our board are looking for and then how we discuss with them. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Um, Amar, you can follow on from that, hopefully. Yeah, sure. I mean, um, one example comes to mind, and you know, Ray mentioned Drama Queen, and uh, what comes to mind is Heartbleed. I think Heartbleed generated many Drama Queens, if I may. <laughs> um, um, you know, I had a couple of CISOs telling me that they were expecting immediate funding just by mentioning Heartbleed. The only advantage they had, which turned out to be a bit of a disadvantage, was that many in the board had also heard about Heartbleed, but, you know, the two or three CISOs I spoke to did not have <clears throat> the facts and figures in ready for the board. So they walked in. Um, thinking if they mentioned Heartbleed, and just because CNN and you know uh, BBC, Sky, everybody picked it up, they were expecting um, you know an audience that would listen to them, but without actually understanding how what Heartbleed meant for the business. So uh, you know to to stress upon the fact that a lot of the times Heartbleed or a database means nothing to anyone unless you can relate it back to how it affects the business process um, that concerns the board. And if you can figure that out, you already are starting with a winning hand, rather than just going and crying um, out loud saying, we have a heartbeat problem and I need half a million pounds to fix it. Yeah, I, think, I think that's um, really good advice. I think it's very important that people get away from the scare tactics that we used to use many years ago, try and force money out of um, out of the board. Um, Gary, uh, your experience, please. Yeah, I guess the first thing I'd say is um, which board, um, because I report to at least four boards: um, the main board, clearly, but uh, then I have our audit committee that has a lot of our non-execs on it, our operational risk committee. Um, and then um, a committee that looks at uh, our reputation and our branding. Um, so you, you, they're going to look at things from different perspectives. 
But the one thing that, that, that's very clear from our board members are that, um, you know, they read, the, they read the news, they listen to the news and what have you. So they have a good idea what's going on. Um, and uh, what, I, what I find is that uh, you need to go in. It needs to be absolutely relevant. You need to recognize the fact that um, they are probably looking for different things. Um, and therefore, you need to make sure that when you're talking to them, you're talking around the, the particular aspect that they're interested in. Um, there are some, some sort of key questions that uh, come across. I, I actually put a lot into a pre-read, so, and I've got half a dozen questions that are in there that I think the board should be asking me, and I provide answers. But it's all around, you know, how vulnerable are we? Is that relevant to us? What are we doing about it? And probably one of the key ones is, you know, how do we compare to other organizations? Are we wildly adrift in what we're doing, what we're seeing? Uh, and if so, why? What do we need to do about it? Um, and we shouldn't forget that um, you probably get a limited amount of time to a board that's got a lot of other things to look at as well. So you've got to be really focused in what you give them and make sure that it's addressing the message you want to get across, but also addressing what they're likely to want to hear from you. Gary, if I may, just before Paul takes, takes us past that, the, there is a point that the underlying message to all of those boards, and you're right, the messages are going to be tailored differently, but it is important that there's an underlying tone of message that is kept the same. All of these boards understand business risk and that's what we're in the business of. You know, as security and risk professionals, our role is to actually help them translate the impacts of security and risk into business risk and impact, and vice versa, you know, the top-down requirements into how we operate. So it's a great point you make around the different boards, but I would argue that there's still an underlying tone that we need to maintain a message in. Absolutely, it's it's the way that you. I think the way that you present that is is could be slightly different depending on the board that you're addressing. So, so I think that that kind of leads on to the next question, which is quite good because I, I was going to say, in my experience, you know, um, the boards have different levels of understanding when it comes to cybersecurity and the threat that it actually poses, and their levels of expe expectation can be very different. Um, so I guess the question is, how do you engage and manage your board's expectations? Um, and to me, it, it's quite important. How do you maintain that engagement? So can we start I mean, with If I mark? may just add, yeah, I mean, I'm sorry, I, I, was, I was going to answer anyway. Um, if one of the things, that, there are two issues here. One is context, right? Um, but the other same, at the same time, there's the, the issue of consistency. Um, if your message changes uh, from month to month or even from board to board, there's a problem. But at the same time, there's the, the issue of context. You, you know, um, as Gary was saying, um, in different companies, there's a different context. Um, and within the same company, there might be multiple contexts, right? There might be very, very strategic, and there might be others who have a slightly different uh, concern. So the managing consistency at the same time is very important. Your message has to remain consistent because if it isn't, then you're leaving yourself exposed to uh, people kind of blowing holes in your your your, your arguments and your your presentations that you're, you're making. So it's, it's, it's an interesting balance. How do you focus uh, on the context, but at the same time, how do you maintain the same consistency in the message. Thanks, Amar. Um, Gary, do you want to pick up on that? Yeah, I, I, you know, it's really interesting. Um, last, last year, um, we had a, a, um, a new non-exec director join us who had some experience in both IT and, uh, and security. Um, She's become a very close ally. Um, it's really great when um, I know that I can go into the board and, you know, she's alongside with me. So, you know, engaging with the board is all about every opportunity. Um, but also, 
one of the things that uh, I find really important is to get my business colleagues that are going into the board, perhaps presenting something on a on a business opportunity or what have you, to actually talk about security as part of that, because that then shows that you know we're taking into account what the business requirements are. We've we've got some business buy-in. They recognise that security is a, an important component. Um, so it does. It needs to be focused. Um, I think the other thing that we we need to to look at very carefully is there's an awful lot of stuff going on at the moment. There's barely a day goes by without you reading about a breach or what have you, and you you need to put that um, to Amar's point about in context within your organisation. So, for instance, you know there was a lot made of the of the target breach. Um, you know put that into context within our organization um, once we, we knew what was going on there, could that happen to us? I mean, that was a question uh, that came up at one of the boards. So you've got to be able to respond um, to events and you've also got to show that you're right up to date with what's going on. Thanks, Gary. Uh, and what's your experience, Ray? Yeah, and it is about this engagement and context. And if you look at some of the attendees today, you've got a really broad mix of organizations, but the simple tools that you can use. And, you know, I, I was in charge of four CISOs for our organization in BT up until a couple of years ago where I took on a new role. And, and part of what we did was to engage all of the senior stakeholders regularly on one-to-ones. And the critical thing about that is those stakeholders not going to see them just when there's an incident, just when you need money. It is about building relationships, and Gary said it about the non-executive director and his organization. So part of what we did to ensure that we had those relationships and we knew that we could call on the support was to go and see them and the relevance to them, but make sure that you do it regularly. Go and see them for 30 minutes with a very small topic, you know, Go and check their pulse and the heartbeat. How are things? How are we performing? What are we doing in these areas? And we found that really, really helped us engage the senior stakeholders better right across all the organization, right across all those different boards. But also, it made sure that they were aware of what we were doing. I and nobody like unexpected things to just come at us. And Nobody really likes that. So when these things happen, making sure that they're aware of how we're going to deal with them, and incidents in particular, is a really good way to stop knee-jerk reactions. And because you've spoke to them early in the processes and early in your uh, relationship, then they'll support you because they know what's going on. doesn't mean that it's not fractious because everybody's you know, a bit jumpy about what's going on, but as long as they know how you're going to deal with it and they're aware, then it's great. You know, they'll support you more. But it seriously is about taking those regular one-to-ones and not going to see them when it's a tension moment. Go and see them anytime and make it a very small agenda. Just cover one or two things. May, may I just oh, add to that? Um, uh, sorry. Um, what I was going to say was one of the things I've learned is you have to be able to, uh, the way I approach it is drink a lot of coffee. Um, um, and 15 minutes is normally more than enough. One example comes to mind is um, one particular senior, senior stakeholder. I had a 10-minute conversation with him every two months, and he did not ever, ever mention, we, we never spoke about cybersecurity or data privacy. We, I just said, how can I support you? And he said, Amar, there's nothing you can do. And we had a coffee and we moved on. That, that gentleman became one of my key allies when the time came. So just to expand on what Ray was mentioning there, it is really key to keep this on a, you, you need to be able to socialize and meet and, and support people. Yeah. Perhaps yeah, I can I, come I, in with I, an, I a, 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 an example here as well, that um, we actually have some overnight accommodation on our campus and one of my team was staying overnight 
um, and I make sure that my team know exactly what I'm thinking and that you know they're they're well briefed on what's going on. And this particular individual that was part of my team um, went down to the lounge area, had some coffee, and uh, this chap walked in. He didn't know who he was, and it was the chairman of our company. Um, so they spent a couple of hours talking. Um, and so, you know, opportunities come at you all the time. Be ready for that. You know, people talk about the elevator pitch. It's not just about that. Um, it is about, you know, seeing people regularly, and, and just talking through with them and, you know, just getting getting the messages across in sometimes in the informal atmosphere really helps when you get down to, you know, in the boardroom. No, I, I, I agree absolutely. I think it's critical that you get allies both, um, you know, inside the board and out, um, that the message is consistent and that, um, you know, you do socialize with these people. Um, it, nothing, nothing wor it, there's nothing worse than feeling that the only time somebody talks to you is when they want something. So, um, yeah, absolutely agree. Um, so uh, you seem to be quite fortunate, Gary. In my, uh, in, um, it's it's kind of unusual uh, and to to see somebody with IT and cybersecurity background, um, you know, or a resume that, con that contains it on the board. Um, so I think you're quite fortunate to have found one. But based on that, um, what kind of language do you need to use uh, when when you speak to the board? Because quite often that they aren't they aren't technical people. They um, they they do struggle. And I mean, at the board level, you don't you don't want to be down in the weeds. You need to be quite high level. So um, Gary, if you wouldn't mind going first, can you just explain to us how you speak to the board in what kind of language? Well, um, techno babble, as I call it, just doesn't work. Um, you might have a little bit of that in the informal discussions, one-to-one um, -one with board members outside of the, the board environment. But basically, simple, non-technical language put in a business context. Um, they understand, um, my board understand insurance. That's what it's all about. Um, so we talk, we, we talk about the impact on the insurance market, uh, we talk about um, how it would impact some of the business we're doing, some of the business opportunities we're looking at, the impacts of cyber cyber risk on on the business area. Um, my presentations never have anything technical in them. They're very simple, very straightforward, um, and they're not looking for that. Um, as you say, a majority of I think of my board. Um, you know, struggle with some of the technology. But that's also a way in as well. So um, that helps you get closer to the board um, if, you know, if, for instance, they've got a problem with, uh, with, with their tablet device or what have you, you, you can use that to, 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 to get closer to them. Simple, non-technical, business relevant every time. Okay. Uh, Ray, I'm guessing it's similar with yours, but please... You know, give us a bit of an insight. It is, it is. But um, and it's uh, Gary knows he, he stole my notes. So <laughs> I said something earlier on. And, and you um, took mine. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, again, when you look at the breadth of the organisations joining this call today, it's, it's fantastic. And one key thing that is common across them all, and and the way that you engage with them, is certainly don't be emotional. So when we talk with the board, and, and, and I serve on a couple of boards for our organization, and I sit on a couple of, as a non-exec, don't come at it emotionally. It is only a job. I said it earlier on. Our role as risk and security professionals is to convey that risk. Come at it with passion and come at it with facts, you know, where you can get them. And... These boards understand business risks. And what you've got to do is just talk that way and convey it in that way. And that's the really important point there. And relate it to the business, your business, their business, whoever you're engaging with. Just make it relational. But remove emotion. Make it a passion, and that's absolutely fine. You'll get support. But as soon as it becomes emotional, and you must be a non-victim, don't take on the victim mentality of it's everyone else's fault or, you know, we can't deal with it because X isn't doing this. 
be pragmatic, as I said. And something that one of the questions, gentlemen, and thank you for this, Nigel Cox, is plays to it really nicely. He's asked this question about how do we make, you know, the application of security in organizations not seen as just an insurance, you know, uh, payment. And, and this comes down to how we convey it. And it's actually fairly straightforward if you do some of the things that we talked about, the engagement, the understanding of what it is you're delivering as benefits to the organization and conveying it to them. And what I mean by that is I use very simple examples of, you know, we use various security technologies to allow us to trade across the web. And it's the most basic, but we all forget these simple things. You say, well, we trade with business partners. We trade in the open markets. That is enabled by security. You don't do that as an insurance risk. That is enabling business operations. And the key thing there for Nigel and everyone else is to pick those instances where you're enabling you know, the organization to operate in a way it couldn't before. And that to me, and protect it and give all the good things that we expect around confidentiality, integrity, and availability. But if you convey that, you start to dispel the myths of, well, it's just insurance. Why do we need it? So really critical there. A lot. Apologies for the long answer. OK, that's fine. Um, Amar, based on the fact that you've yes. worked with a number of different organizations and their boards, um, I, I, from, from what I've heard from Gary and, and Ray, it sounds like it's, the, it's pretty much the same um, messaging language across the board. But just confirm, if you wouldn't mind. One of the things I've had to kind of learn is um, moving to different organizations. One of the tips, I guess, for anyone is try to, everyone speaks a different, slightly different language in terms of, although everyone's hopefully speaking English, uh, given, you know, different boards have different contexts. One of the things I normally do is try to understand what particular vocabulary taxonomy is used within a business. You know, um, risk, e even the word risk may have a completely different meaning from one board in a company to another. Um, and that can be a showstopper for someone who is, you know, going to go there the first time or the second time and not really understand why when he or she says, oh, the risk is very high and people go, yeah, or people jump up and say, how high? Um, on that note, the other headache um, that I've seen many times with uh, a lot of other CISOs is, um, and I guess sometimes the media has a bit of a responsibility here. There are so many reports that come out placing different uh, values on incidents. And what is happening is more and more people are remembering the figures and just using them as a open quotes excuse and uh, to get, um, you know, buy-in from the board. Now, that, in my opinion, never works because that is a uh, contextless figure that is being published to generate audience. And in many cases, the, anybody and people are on the board are smart. You know, they're not there just by accident in most cases. So they are going to poke holes through the, the figures that you're going to throw out. So those are the two tips I would, I would give in addition to what's been said. Thanks very much. That that was uh, that was very interesting, actually. I'm uh, I'm going to move it along because um, I don't want to fall behind on the time. So um, let's move on to the next uh, question. So you know, different business verticals reside within different threat landscapes. Um, they can be bound by legis legis yeah I can't get that one out legislative and regulatory standards and requirements, um, and, and even organisations within a particular vertical. Uh, can have a different risk posture based on, you know, their appetite for risk acceptance, transference, and mitigation. Um, so we're lucky to have three of you here in three different verticals. So it'd be interesting to see if there's if there's much difference. But how much emphasis do you place on compliance versus risk versus security? Um, I'd like to throw that one to Ray first. Yeah, this has been a, uh, a really interesting topic for us as an organization as we've evolved our security strategy over the years. 
and I, I start with saying security strategy because that's all encompassing for us because it includes risk, it includes compliance, it includes fraud, it includes physical. So we really operate as a true CSO model. And the reason it's become a big topic is because of the fact that we've now, for example, got data privacy officers which sit outside of the security function. So understanding how we engage with those other units and other organizations to fulfill the needs of our organization has been a challenge, but now we've come to a, a form of harmony, should I say, and um, it's about knowing your roles and then understanding the impact of each area. So for us, you know, what is the impact of compliance on security and what does it increase the risk? So it's always threaded throughout and you can't ignore and it does depend the area of compliance you're looking at, Paul, because obviously there's so many different areas and there's so many different regional views and differences from whether you're operating in Europe or in the US or in Asia, etc. Or you might just be a domestic in the UK or in one of those different countries. So it's really important to understand the impact of each. It's quite a, quite a challenging question because you can't take it apart and say they're each separate. So it is about, though, for me, matching the security risk and those areas of risk to the business impact, you know, where we're able to, you know, simple. If this happens, this is the impact. You know, we, we talked about Heartbleed earlier on. You know, a different example many of us lived through, you know, was when RSA had its uh, various seeds and algorithms, you know, stolen around the, uh, the secure ID tokens. You know, that was really difficult for us because it came across in different areas of compliance, you know, security threats, you know, risk exposure. And we were working on minimal facts at the time. You know, for those that went through it, they'll remember the challenges we had. But it was about conveying all the things we've just previously discussed with the relationships and the engagement to make sure that we understood where the impacts were in those different areas. So just trying to bring it to life there. Paul? Gary, what about, what about from your perspective? Sorry, I, I seem to drop the lines there for a second. Um, can, we, can we go to Gary and, and see what your yep. perspective is on this? Okay. Um, well, for me, it's all about a balanced view. Um, it's all about impact and what have you. W w uh, i give you a small example there. It's interesting that Ray mentioned about sort of, uh, you know, data privacy and what have you. Uh, we're a UK-based company. Um, but we actually have an operation in the Isle of Man. We have an operation in Jersey. They have different compliance regulations, and, and so we, we, we need to be aware of that. We're in the process of moving to cloud. Um, so where's our data going? Um, you know, we need to, to look at that. Um, and, and even though we're UK-based and, and don't have any operations in what would typically, uh, we would say, would be overseas as such, um, there's impacts on us. Um, and this, is, this has been a, a bit of an eye-opener within the organization. The second point I'd like to make is about we're a regulated organization. Um, and um, if I go back two or three years, you know, it was all about, well, it's going to happen. It's going to happen to the banks. You know, it's not going to happen to insurance companies. They really haven't got, uh, you know, people are after money and what have you. It's not about that now. It's, a, it's about data assets. Um, and we have some fairly significant assets there. We also have regulators now that are taking a very keen interest. Um, if you go back to uh, three or four years ago, the FSA did a little bit around information security, but not an awful lot. What we've seen particularly in the last uh, three to six months is the PRA here in the UK taking a much keener interest and actually issuing uh, letters to CEOs of financial organizations about what their expectations are. So that, that's actually been a good sort of wake-up call from externally. Um, but we need to balance between the requirements of the regulator that, that clearly are, are very important to us against the impact that it, 
it could have on us and the risk that we're we're we're, we're taking. We're in the risk business. We should be able to do that. Um, I'm giving some consideration to using some of the insurance modelling that we have uh, about the insurance business that we run and applying that to our risk and security environments and using some of the actuarial techniques to actually uh, build up a much better risk model um, uh, in the hope that that will will help me to get uh, some background to this balance view rather than it being you know, a little bit subjective at the moment. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that, Gary. That's um, that's pretty much the lines that I would have gone down as well, to be honest. Uh, um, I, I I like. I mean, the the regulatory stuff is is quite um, critical, but I find a lot of um, a lot of organisations have, have kind of treated it almost like a tick box tick box uh, thing, and and it to me that's a waste of money and a waste of effort on everyone's part. And I think we're starting to move away from that now because people are taking much more interest. So, um, sorry to uh, steal anything, but can we go across to Amar? Amar, um, can you give us your points around this? Yeah, sure. I mean, um, one thing that really helps um, in terms of emphasis is audit. So many large organizations should um, hopefully have internal audit functions, for example. Um, that is often a lot given a lot of attention at very senior level. Um, again, one of the strategies is try to make friends with the internal auditors, uh, which means you have to speak the audit language, going back to the earlier question. Um, emphasis on compliance is definitely increasing uh, across different types of organizations that, I'm, that I work with. And sadly, as you say, although it's a tick box exercise, it's one way um, you know, to get a bit of uh, time in front of uh, the, the board. I mean, the EU uh, DPR, although focused on data privacy, um, DPO-related uh, topics, is also giving an opportunity for folks who are practicing cyber security, information security, to start working and, you know, getting themselves noticed a bit in, in the board. But I think on, on that note, you need to work with the DPO and the audit. Um, if, if an audit, I mean, most CEOs also listen to audit recommendations um, more than a lot of other things. And that must also be a focus of anyone who is trying to, you know, get on the right side of the board. Okay. Paul, if I may come come back in again, um, something that yeah. just just sprung to mind with, about sort of compliance um, is um, a lot of organisations now are going for the PCI DSS compliance um, and uh, all that that entails, so that they can continue to take card payments. Actually, you know, it's very prescriptive, um, but there's a lot of basic 101 information security stuff in there, things that you should have um, that maybe, you know, have never got high enough up on the, uh, on the agenda for, for group IT to put them in and so on and so forth. So, you know, uh, if you're going for uh, PCI DSS accreditation then, and compliance, then you know that's another good way of getting some of these other aspects of information security into your organisation as well. I agree, and most organisations, when they you know when they attack that, they'll they'll find that they're they're probably you know somewhere between depending on the organisation, obviously, but somewhere between 50 and 70 percent of the way there already. Um, it's just tightening up um, around some of the uh, security. Uh, requirements and then there's you know there's the uh, the thirty percent on top, which is where all the work comes in so yeah, yeah no very good point um, so let's move on to the next one, and I really like this question because in my experience, people react more quickly to three things: imminent danger, pain, and pleasure, and I really can't see pleasure being something that drives um, budget for cybersecurity. <laughs> So that leaves us two others. Um, so the question, I guess, it, I'll put this one to Omar first. Um, it, is there a golden ticket that gains you immediate access to budget? <laughs> well, if I may answer it, it's definitely not hard bleed or any da any uh, you know wonderful incident that shows up on on the media. Um, uh, 
for some reason, repeatedly people think if Target, if Sony, Ashley Madison, for example, or Carphone mm-hmm. Warehouse show up on the media, it gives them an immediate easy route or route into the budget uh, books. Um, so that is not the golden ticket, if I may, right? Um, it's a bit dreary, but I think sticking with the facts and figures, sticking with what the, the, the I mean, uh, the, the, to answer the question straightforwardly, it's audit. My experience is if you can get audit um, reports that favor uh, investment in your within your particular area, um, it's normally easier to get budget. You have to be careful because if you've been there quite long, then it may reflect bad on you. So, you know, there's a balance here. Um, Gary? Yeah, um, well, I've got something that I've written down here called um, CRBA. Um, the very first thing that's a, that's a golden ticket is if it's going to impact our customers, because we're very precious about our customers, uh, then um, that's a good way in to get get some budget there. If our customer data is at risk, which is our lifeblood, uh, then um, that, that goes pretty high. But right behind that is regulation. So if we get the regulator saying, you know, they, they, they want us to do something. And they have done that with some insurance companies recently. They have gone in as part of their supervisory b- visits and said, do you have? And uh, if the response has been no, then it's been, you need to get. So regulation comes in. Um, and then the, the, the next two, uh, I've got B-A-N-A-B. Uh, B is brand, which is linked to customer. So if we think there's an overall brand impact, um, Again, we're very precious about our brand. And audit, um, Amar's absolutely right. Audit, but, but what I found with audit is um, they don't necessarily put things into context. Um, so they, mm. they typically want the ideal world. Um, and the ideal world is not necessarily where we want to be. And then we get into the whole thing around risk appetite, et cetera, et cetera. But um, any one of those four could be your golden ticket and it really depends on on the business impact as to how big a ticket that is okay well that fits nicely in with imminent danger and pain for me so ray what about your side okay so for me i um i suppose i have a little bit of a different view here because we've all got the people doing fear uncertainty diet all the people who like to try and create a drama to get additional budget. But we can dispel the fact that certain things, when they happen, which the guys have already been talking about, will actually help us have a conversation. Whether or not they get the budget is a different point. Now, there are times when we know certain things will get fixed because there's been a problem and we deal with it. And we've all got examples of that. But in terms of a golden ticket, I I struggle with this this a little bit because we tend to use fear, uncertainty, and doubt as a way to create that, which then undermines all the other things that we've been talking about for the last 45 minutes. So we have to play very carefully here. If it creates a conversation and it's a mature conversation, you're more likely to get budget versus a knee-jerk reaction or a drama coming out of a crisis. So... That's my views there. Great. Thanks for that. I've, I've actually got a question from uh, a member of the audience. So um, ben, uh, Benjamin Donaghy uh, says, um, what is the panel's opinion of using assessments by external consultants to support the case for investment? Um, and I'll open that one up, and whoever gets in first can have it. Um, my take on that, I was actually trying to answer it, Benjamin, sorry. Um, my take on that is, uh, similar to audit reports, um, it really depends on, number one, who has initiated um, the external consultant. Um, seeing many different uh, uh, organizations, sometimes it can be an excuse for you know taking some drastic action. Um, it, it can be helpful as much as an internal audit uh, or a report can be helpful. But 
in, in many cases, yes, it does uh, drive some investment because it's coming from an external, open quote, independent um, uh, viewpoint. Uh, from my perspective, it's a double-edged sword. Um, it can be of use, but you have to be incredibly careful. Um, I agree with what Amar said about uh, it depends who initiates this. Um, and we, we shouldn't forget that, um, you know, particularly non-exec directors, uh, they sit on other boards. They have perhaps similar um, situations there. They may have some input from there where they've already got some external input and, and, and what have you. Um, so uh, you, you need you need to be careful. Um, I think that again, it's the balanced view, um, and it can be useful. And there again, it can work against you. So I, I agree with the guys, but also I think it's important to remember it's no different to any other of the health and hygiene factors of the organisation and business operations that get signed off by external organizations. You know, quite often organizations will bring in, for example, nothing to do with security and risk. You know, we want to look at our strategy, so they might bring a McKinsey in, or they might bring a, you know, we want to look at the, the way that our financial operations are operating. Let's bring in someone who's going to look at it from a different perspective, like a Booz and Ham, uh, Allen, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I agree with the guys. It's a double-edged sword but it is about embracing it in the right way because it mm. does help also in terms of the golden ticket because that's a way to help, you know, get an independent view for some of the budget that sometimes you've been fighting for and you can't quite push it over the edge and get in that external view. It, it really does help you know, because it's an independence. So I think you just have to embrace it it does come back to all the things said already about who's initiated it and why, et cetera. But, you know, if you push against it, it will go against you for sure. Great. I hope that, um, hope that answered the question. Uh, it certainly did from my perspective. Um, okay. Well, thanks, guys. That was great to get your hints, tips, and insights. But now I'm going to ask you to delve back through the conversation and for each of you to come up with what you would class as your three takeaways um, from the conversations today. Um, Amar, do you want to go first? Yeah, um, definitely. Give me one second. So my three takeaways, I'll start from the middle one, which was, to me, actually very, very relevant. I mean, I'm just reading an article. Um, Bank of England has recently, in their financial um, uh, you know, report encouraged and made an, uh, an observation that financial institutions are still viewing online security threats as technical issues, right? Um, and they need to be tackled at the board level. But the challenge is, how do you encourage the board to at least understand the basics um, of what is cyber and privacy? They don't need to understand technical. And it's a two-way challenge as we've been discussing is for us to speak the board language, but also for them to understand what we are saying. So somehow find a way to encourage board and senior executives. Basically the message is cyber and privacy are a board responsibility as much as anything else. Moving on very quickly, consider understand focus on the business processes. Uh, if you don't understand the business process that is gonna keep the board awake, then you know uh, you're talking complete different language. It has to be a business process, a bit, uh, something that is going to affect the business. Uh, business risk integrate not align your risk framework and register. A lot of the times, the risk register is left as a separate item. No one looks at it, and no one understands it in the IT domain. It's about time that people uh, integrate and kind of become one with the rest of the business register. Okay, thanks for that. Um, Ray, what, what are your three takeaways? I'm going to keep these fairly short and sweet so maybe we can get some questions. Clarity, clarity of what's important to the board and keep your messaging simple. Remain unemotional. You know, it isn't personal, but you can bring passion to your roles. There's nothing wrong with that, but it isn't personal. 
Remember our roles. We advise our organizations as professionals in security and risk and deliver the message cleanly, succinctly, without babble, whether that's technology, whether it's around risk or security. Just make sure it's clear in your communication. Thank you. Thanks, Ray. Gary? Well, I, I go back to uh, never miss an opportunity to get your message across and, and be prepared. Um, I, I'm rather fortunate that uh, I've been invited to do a couple of continuous professional development uh, presentations. I never turn anything down uh, that's of that ilk. Um, have your elevator pitch uh, uh, ready up your sleeve because um, you never know who you'll bump into. So, um, you know, just, just, just keep getting that message across. And I think that that also plays to Ray's point about passion. I think that's absolutely essential that uh, people see how passionate you are about this. I think also you need to focus on the impact to your board members in their role and, and prioritize. Um, you know, if you if you look at uh, uh, from the data protection side, um, if there's an undertaking, that's a personal undertaking if you're in breach. Um, and a lot of people don't realize that. A lot of CEOs don't realize that that's, that's there. But it's, it's, it's not about, um, you know, the threats and, and uh, creating a sort of an explode, explosive environment where they're all worried about everything, but, but, but focus on um, exactly what they need to be concerned about. The, the idea that I, I put forward about uh, the questions that they should be asking me um, we started off with you know two or three. They've expanded that, um, and I'm expecting to see some more come through after the board meeting next week. And then finally, um, techno babble doesn't work. Um, keep it simple. Keep it in their language. Help them to understand. Um, don't confuse them, um, and don't make them feel threatened. Um, you know, with with things. Um, the old days of talking tech, technical and what have you are way gone. Put it in a business context. Great. Thanks for that. Thank um, and, and my three takeaways. So uh, the thing that I've picked up on this is it, don't go in there prepared to answer the question, are we secure, but rather how secure are we? And with regards to that, I mean, you know, you need to know uh, where your risks are. You need to make sure that your organization have policies and programs in place to help mitigate the risks that you know about. And then um, it's always nice to go in and demonstrate the successes and show your improvement plan because that will, um, will also help you towards gaining the budget. Um, the second one would be build and maintain your credibility with the board. We talked about this earlier. It's having, you know, having connections inside and out. But ensure you can show how, you know, what you're asking for, the requirements you have, can help drive commercial success and support the business. Um, don't, as we've already said, don't use the technical jargon. Um, try and use stories. Try and make them current. Um, use information that's, that you know that the board will have, uh, have been reading about and they may have seen on national media, but make sure it's relevant to your organization. Don't just use it as a, as a stick to beat people with. Um, and finally, you know, if, if you find the, I guess from your perspective, one of the points I think you brought out was if, if you're finding it difficult um, or you feel underpowered, then, then you need to get those connections. So try, you know, try getting people, um, other people that are going into the board to uh, uh, come online with, with what you're requiring. And then also it's always um, a good option to, to look at the board members and see if it's possible to get one of those to, to act as a mentor for you because that always gives you a link in as well. Um, and my final one would be um, prepare, plan, and then prepare some more because, you know, you've got to be prepared for an attack because it will come. Um, make sure your plan, uh, as, as uh, Ray said, make sure that your plan is easy to follow, simple to implement, and understood by all. So it has to be clear and succinct. And then finally, um, if, you, if you are unfortunate you get a breach or an attack, then reflect, improve, and then prepare for the next one. Um, so they're my three. Uh, I think that's all the questions covered. Uh, if anybody has questions, can you please um, type them in on the QA 
now um, while we're waiting for that to happen, because I'm hoping some more questions will come in. Um, I'd like to just quickly thank the panel. Thank you very much. It's been enlightening. There's, uh, there's been some very good tips and hints come out there. Uh, I'm hoping there's some more come out during the question time. Um, but just for those who um, are attending, just a, a quick um, brief on who we are as Tripwire. So um, Tripwire is a trusted partner for many global companies. We provide cybersecurity and cyber risk solutions. Um, we've got a portfolio of products and solutions that uh, are aimed to assist, help you understand you know, what you have in your environment, how well you're doing from a security compliance perspective, uh, and help you to detect vulnerabilities, uh, indicators of breach and compromises, um, hopefully before they happen, uh, and ensure things are operating as you would expect from, um, from the systems you have within your environment. Um, it's, it's really our aim, it's interesting, wasn't expecting that. It's really our aim to you know, help you build uh, what we call an adaptive threat protection solution that enables you to integrate many of the sensors that you already have within your environments so that you can quickly assess um, what the problem is, identify the potential business impacts, uh, which as we've heard today is, is critical, uh, and to determine what steps you want to take to resolve things. So, again, thank you, gents. It's uh, it's been a pleasure and our privilege. Um, I, I think there's been some really good points come out. Um, I'd like to thank all those people that have attended, that taken some time out of their day to come on this uh, this webinar. Um, <laughs> Paul, sorry to interrupt you. I think there's a question from David Thomas. I don't know if you've seen that. So there's a few questions coming in. Thank you, everyone. I'll let Paul Good. come back. Good. So should we should we jump to the questions um, and then let's have a look. So David, uh, there's a clear need for high skilled security professionals to be more business savvy. What does the panel think organisations should be doing to ensure their business skills, these business skills? Um, again, I. I'll throw these open to the floor. I don't mind. Um, I'm not going to choose somebody to answer. Um, so let me what start. I've done before. All right, go on. Oh, go on, Amar. <laughs> no, go on, Amar. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, I, I was just saying, um, shadow someone uh, to mentor you. Mentor. That that works. It's worked before. Yeah, and looking outside of your your organisation is a really important place here, Dave. Um, and understanding, you know, so while I've, I've trained in security and operated in security for 30 plus years, I actually decided not to do an MSc. I did an, um, a BA in business studies and looking to do my MBA. So cross-skilling is really important as you move through your career path. And again, looking at the organization, some of the attendees, you know, it's good to have all the fundamental security and be a security person, whether technical or, you know, uh, policy side or risk side based. But as you progress up your career, it is important to look at those other skills like business. So whether it's courses or getting mentored is a really important area. Yeah, we, we, uh, we actually allow people to, um, or actually promote people to go and work in our business areas. Um, sometimes it's uh, a day a week or sometimes it's for a five-day period but going around the key business areas to understand how those business teams work and understand our business um, as well as talking to all the executives um, on our board um, and getting their perspective so the executives know the senior members of my team and the senior members of my team know the executives really key so, um, guys, we, we've probably got time for one more question before I have to hand back over to Melanie to, to close this down because we, we have to finish at 11.30. But, um, so, um, let's, let's take the one that's uh, any tips on introducing a new CISO um, to the security position. So, Ray, um, I, I think you can jump in on this one. 
So for me, I, mean, I can't actually see that question, but I think it's about really spending time to get around the organization and talk to all the stakeholders and engage, you know, but engage from the bottom up to see what the organization is looking like and working like, but also go back to what I said around understanding the pulse and heartbeat from your stakeholders as well. And then as a new CISO, you get to understand what and how the, the business really feels about how you're performing and supporting it. So, you know, some really simple ones there, but it is actually, I've said this before, two ears, one mouth, use them in that order. Excellent. Thanks, um, Paul. Unfortunately, we don't, we, we don't have time to take the other questions, although we will get answers back to you. Um, these questions will go out to all the members of the team today, um, and we can, uh, we can put the responses together and, and send them back to you. Um, just one note, um, we do, on the Tripwire website, which is www.tripwire.com forward slash cyber literacy, there is a lot of new information on there. Um, it's been updated specifically for the UK, uh, and there are some very good tools in there that, that CISOs um, can use, uh, documentation and uh, some, um, some short pamphlets and booklets. So um, anybody can go onto that uh, site and download. You're very welcome. Um, and I'd like to set this opportunity again to thank the panel. I think it's been an excellent um, discussion. Uh, and Mel, I'd like to now hand it back over to you. Thanks, Paul. Yes, um, I'll just echo Paul's thoughts there. Great, uh, great session. Really enjoyed listening to the different perspectives from everybody. So I'd just like to, again, thank Amar, Ray, Gary, and Paul for their time today, and thank everybody for listening. As Paul mentioned, we will get back to all of the questions, um, and also this session will be, has been recorded and will be available on demand. You will get the link, um, and it will also be available on the Tripwire website. So uh, thanks very much again, everybody, and have a great day.